So, um, over the next uh, 15 minutes, um, I hope to take you through why we should be considering a whole systems approach to academic healthcare and speak a little bit about the vehicle uh, to move us towards that whole systems approach, which is uh, the development and growth of academic health science systems. And then um, bring it back to you know the impact on the patient, the patient journey. And I think the piece that I've been particularly asked to also concentrate on my personal research journey as illuminating things from the ground up. And then I suppose to move to the question of uh, the day, which is why now, and how will we move forward? So. It comes as no surprise to us that the scale and complexity of the challenges facing modern healthcare require a whole systems approach to management. And when bridges are built between education, research and clinical care, activities can be aligned so that patient care is based on population needs and priorities. Education is restructured to meet the evolving and changing needs of society and research is linked to improved health outcomes. And Wartman calls this the virtuous cycle of academic health care because education, research and clinical care work together and support each other to make each other better. So in order to reap the rewards of the virtuous cycle of academic healthcare provision, a paradigm shift has to occur where we need to move from thinking as, edu as education and research and clinical care as being in separate silos and competing with each other to as a, a recognition of that mindset that uh, by working together synergistically, each will have a greater impact on patient care. As Professor Fall has said, clinical care is better when provided in a research active organisation. So this uh, slide represents a diagrammatic approach to the tripartite miss mission of, of uh, Borden and colleagues. And you'll see there the four um, quadrants representing the major areas of impact innovation, health, community and policy. And the Venn diagram shows that in the areas of intersection, the added benefits that can be achieved where uh, each of the components has opportunity to inform and illuminate each other. So in an academic health sciences system, an educator doesn't simply teach, but rather adopts a critical appraisal mindset where one's teaching is, inform is research informed. And as one teaches, one maintains that critical appraisal mindset and engages in a, quality, a continuous quality improvement methodology so that either by employing QI methods or more formal research engagement, one continuously improves one's educational practice and in turn produces students that have critical appraisal mindsets and that apply evidence-based care in their clinical care. So you see in each of those, those areas of the diagram, research informs education, education informs research, research informs clinical care. Clinical care should drive the activities of research. So I spoke about the academic health science systems as being the vehicle to, to, to drive us towards this vision. And the Higgins report, which we will remember as um, being uh, fundamental in establishing the hospital groups, actually had the academic health science system as a core component of that report. So there was the appointment of the chief academic officers to the hospital groups. But as the chief academic officers describe in, in, in one of their explanatory documents, an academic health science system really should be seen as a fully coordinated partnership. So moving from ad hoc, you know, informal goodwill relationships to a really considered, organised, funded, well-governed partnership between a university and a healthcare system. And you see there a really important word. It's not between a university and a hospital, where traditionally the focus has been. It's between a, a, a healthcare system, which means reaching out and looking into the community 
including both primary care, the community partners, but also, of course, uh, palliative care as a unique organisation that already is set up in that manner, uh, where we don't have those, those barriers or silos in, in practice. And the idea of the academic healthcare system is that it's designed, so it is designed, this is its purpose, it is a considered and structured way of going about delivering quality care hand in hand with teaching, training, research and innovation, and very importantly, incorporating the full spectrum of the healthcare workforce. So again, not just medicine, not medicine and nursing, nursing but the full spectrum, health and social care professionals, and importantly, managers and and, and other members of, of uh, the healthcare organisation. And as we are increasingly recognising the importance of engaging public and private part, or public um, engagement within those as, as part of that partnership. So in terms of the academic health system sciences, is it aligned to, is it a key component of Sloan Care? Absolutely. It enables the right care to be delivered at the right time by the right people in the right place. And it really does underpin that whole system's perspective, moving away from the traditional focus on hospitals only. And of course, the, the problems that we are all encountering on a day-by-day -day basis around staff recruitment, development, retention, working in an academic health science systems um, environment uh, does so much to, to, to address so many of those, those issues. And in the CAO report, they talk about a, um, a commissioned report uh, that was carried out in the UK, where they estimated that an investment of uh, the equivalent in, in, in euros of 324 million, which if you did pro rata population basis to Ireland would be about 28 million per annum, in the NHS clinical research network supported clinical research activity generating 2.4 billion of gross value added and almost 40,000 extra jobs. So something that has a societal benefit. So moving perhaps from a little bit of the theoretical and the abstract to, to, to the patient. So what does academic, say, palliative care look like from a patient perspective? Well, consider John, um, a gentleman in his 50s who presents to the emergency department with chest pain and shortness of breath. Unfortunately, he's found to have a lung malignancy. In an academic healthcare uh, system, he will have research-informed practice. So he will be able to benefit from preci precision medicine and all of the advances in on on oncological therapy. It will be performed and delivered and um, you know, cared for by highly trained professionals. Because we are benefiting from the landmark stu study of Temel and colleagues from an academic health sciences system, he'll have a palliative care approach incorporated throughout his disease journey and hopefully with the advances of medicine he will live well for some years however unfortunately it is likely uh, that at some point his disease will progress and there may come a time where he needs to access clinical trials which again will hopefully generate both benefit for him and for further patients and again in a highly trained uh, workforce with good links and coordination and working as part of a system his care will be provided in his preferred place of care, uh, uh, care as far as is possible which would be the community, with excellent information flow between hospital and community settings. And if there should come a time where end-of-life care is, is moving towards the sole focus of care, care again can be provided by highly trained staff in community or hospice settings. So again, moving from the patient to perhaps my personal <laughs> research journey, um, I suppose my first engagement was research was actually as an intern where um, I was engaged in, uh, in the publication of a case study. And interestingly, that was in a dermatology rotation. And dermatology always would have been quite a research active specialty, uh, quite academic linkages. That did continue through SBR training. Um, I uh, carried out um, a validation study of the confusion assessment method, uh, the, the tool used by Inouye and colleagues in the US in the palliative care setting, the first time that the tool was validated in that setting. And again, that was a little bit of a fortuitous and fortunate relationship. David Marr at that stage was very active in Limerick as a psychiatrist, particular interest in delirium, and I was able to bring that, that forward. 
Um, my research then was solidified by post-training. Uh, I was successful in, in being awarded a HRB research fellowship. So that afforded me two years of, of time to concentrate on palliative care provision for people with intellectual disabilities. And I suppose my first kind of perhaps hiccup or reality in the experience of what it is like to work in an area where I suppose research infrastructure is underdeveloped and there's the pressures of clinical commitment Sorry, Mary, could I have some water, please? Thank you. Was that although I was successful in carrying out the, the research project over the two years, delivered five papers from the project, actually I got a consultant's post, um, you know, pretty much immediately there. And I was like, I will write up my MD. Thank you very much. And of course, the pressures of clinical practice were such that, you know, I didn't get to the point of finishing off the writing up of the MD. And it was a full 10 years later where I again had to re-engage with the process and bring an MD to completion. So in the years as, as a consultant, because the, the, the pressures of clinical practice were such, um, I suppose in the first couple of years, I mainly engaged in research and supporting kind of academic colleagues. And Suzanne Guerin, who'd be known to you from UCD, some of my first exposure there was as clinical supervisor with one of her PhD students. That then, um, I suppose, led me into the UCD clinical pathway. And I think that is a really important pathway for clinicians. So for those of you who don't know, um, there is no protected time for academia recognised, and as such, it's not. They aren't tenured posts, but it is a system whereby uh, clinicians who are research or educational active um, can apply for promotion up a clinical pathway o over the years, and that's externally, uh, you know, appraised and and marked. And what does it give you? I suppose it gives you a recognition of where you are at in your career pathway. It gives you access, I suppose, to electronic library and some of the resources of UCD. And very importantly, it exposes you to a community of clinicians and, and researchers. So an important, an important piece in the journey, but very importantly, does not provide you with any protected clinical time. So in essence, I was working, or I'm working in a job where we have a consultant uh, staffing ratio of about one third recommended levels. Um, so working a job that was commonly 50 hours plus of just pure clinical work nothing to do with management or education or research on top of that. So in order to maintain a clinical pa a, a job, in essence, or I suppose to maintain research activity, I was working above and beyond a full-time job. And again, I suppose the importance of community and drive and everything, my engagement with the Orland Institute of Palliative Care initial grant writing really uh, brought me in contact with so many clinicians. And again, we began to to, to, to build the infrastructure and support. I suppose over those years then, I, I was successful in engaging with a, a number of um, a grant applications through the HSE, HRB, and so on, and culminating then in terms of partnership uh, with one of my key collaborators, Irene Higginson in King's College, uh, London, and Irene was successful in winning a, a, a grant, the Better B grant, uh, in EU funding uh, just before COVID, which was a randomised phase three clinical trial for mirtazapine for the use of refractory breathlessness. And we brought that grant to completion um, and uh, actually have just been told that our paper has been accepted for publication in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, which is, which is fantastic. But I really put it as a final point in this COVID-19 because the impact of COVID on, on clinical practice, on research practice was such that in some ways, um, I suppose while a pause button was placed on clinical research activities, it meant that everything actually accumulated so that in the post-COVID period, we've been hit with the double whammy of quite literally bringing multitudes of projects to completion within very defined timelines and an explosion in clinical activity. Our activity in the matter this year, um, year to date, is up 28% compared to last year with no additional resources. So I... Those are perhaps the negatives. The positives are that really, you know, the community that you meet and, and, and there are too many people to fit onto one slide, but just to acknowledge and the importance of these linkages as developed through the Institute. 
uh, Charles Normand would have been a key mentor and, co and a, a, a colleague through, through my research journey in the Centre for Health Policy and Economics, and along with that, the team that he brought through, who are now mature re researchers themselves, Bridget, Peter, Mary got me over the line, leading IDS tilde, the longitudinal, and re-engaging with my MD and, and getting that through. And as I say, other colleagues along the way through nursing and other disciplines, more recently, Geraldine, uh, in her partnership and shared decision making. And then very importantly, I point to somebody like Peter Doran for his because to carry out a, a clinical trial, you need a fully mature and developed infrastructure. So we need to also be looking outwards to engage in things like the Clinical Research Centre in the universities, um, where Peter would be Professor of Clinical Trials and heading up that piece. So it is not only the networking that goes on in this room, it is of course all of the external pieces. Which brings me to my last couple of slides, which are the challenges, and just to echo, um, I suppose, some of the findings of the survey, if I reflected on the challenges that I have um, encountered over, over the course, I think, obviously, lack of protected time and clinical pressures would be, would be the key piece. The supporting infrastructure, um, underdeveloped if we look at the palliative care field, but yes, obviously, more developed in, in the wider uh, research arena that we reach into, but actually, there are difficulties in accessing that and it can be as simple as being in a different site but sometimes you would swear that I was not a member you know of a clinical pathway within University College Dublin it, such were the barriers it seemed about knocking on the door from the outside in and I think that's something we need to look at I suppose a piece of learning as you go uh, again you know the formal teaching but again the lack of protected time means that you don't have the time to have the cup of coffee and you know engage and talk to other people so you are learning everything continuously yourself and which is the longer way which is you know there it is a good way to learn but equally it is an inefficient way at time a really key one i'd like to point to is the pressure that we experience to under-resource projects in order to be competitive, which essentially means you're relying on precarious staff, um, who again, that's another huge piece I would say it, it is, um, you know, we need to look towards tenured staff for clinical pathways. They should not be reliant on precarious contracts. But you know, the drive is always to move to the next project, not to publish and disseminate in the in you know accordingly. Financial and HR management not tailored for purpose, and then poorly aligned governance structures. The governance structures is there, but then if you look at the way the university will do it compared to the hospice, the HR management, it's not one aligned system. And of course, the lack of career pathways as to where people go as they develop along their piece. Hopefully the policy and strategy environment has improved from when I started out in the journey and of course I have to 2024 there in the corner because we're eagerly awaiting the publication of the palliative care policy which hopefully will support research and education to a degree in that vision of an academic health workforce which really brings me to I suppose that 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 final piece what would success look like well, to me, I would hope that it would mean that we will have infrastructure and processes in place to support high quality, safe and ethical research. We'll have reproduced research outputs, which are publications, expertise, the development of networks. We'll have contributed to continuous quality improvement and we will have impacted on patient care and staff outcomes as well. We'll have retained and attracted best talent and have en enhanced influence and reputation. And we will have embedded patient and carer engagement through all parts of the research journey. And we will have delivered value for money as part of that. Bring it back to what matters. What is the impact of not achieving academic palliative care? Well, to return to John, if he were cared for in an environment that was not an academic healthcare environment, he would potentially uh, receive care that is based on outdated or at best dated practice. He would encounter healthcare professionals with varying levels of competence and care would be provided according to service availability as opposed to the best standards of care. He potentially wouldn't have access to clinical trials, he wouldn't have access to the best standards of care and wouldn't would receive care in an overly hospital centric model which would mean that he would not necessarily achieve goals of spending as much time at home as possible. So our concluding thoughts Ireland is a world leader in palliative care service provision. We are rightly proud of that. But I caution, we will not be a world leader in palliative care if we remain in a research and innovation poor environment. It is simply something that doesn't fit. 
So I think we have a strong foundation on which to build and now is perhaps our unique opportunity to lead and advance patient care, staff training and knowledge through the de development of academic palliative care. Thank you. Thank you.